Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, November 11th, and this is the weekly market update. The disclaimer, anything that you hear or see on this podcast or video is not to be taken as investment advice. I am not a financial advisor. I cannot give you personal financial advice. Please do your own due diligence. It's your money. It's your responsibility. Okay, just a couple of quick things. Last week, the slides got all jacked up. I don't know how. Sometimes technical glitches happen. Um, I'm going to go through and make sure this week that everything, when I upload it, it could have happened during the upload. It could have happened during the recording. Who knows? Um, you know, it takes a lot of time to prepare the slides and then do these uh, presentations and then upload it. So I have a lot of other things going on. I'm just, you know, a one man band here. So if something gets jacked up, then I usually don't necessarily have the time to go back and fix it. I don't do this as a full time job. So I do apologize for that. We'll try to do better in the future. Um, so, yeah. Let's go ahead and move into this week's information. So this is a chart from U.S. School Investors. It shows uh, treasury yields basically for this year, five-year, 10-year, and 30-year. And then it says it has a little peak with a question mark to the upper right. Treasury yields appear to have peaked. Now, one thing that I want to be clear on is when I show you these charts, this is reporting the news. Again, I have a long-term secular view that rates, interest rates are going to go up over time. That doesn't mean that there will be peri there won't be periods where interest rates decline, okay, because of monetary policy, because of the economic situation, okay? That will happen. But I think because of the secular trends around higher inflation due to deglobalization, due to higher you know, commodity prices due to the U.S. and Western Europe, you know, Western world's debt that causes uh, monetary uh, debasement. Uh, you have a secular trend probably for higher rates. Okay, we had a 40-year period where rates declined. It's quite possible we will have a period of decades where rates go up over time. That again, that doesn't mean it, that secular trend won't be punctuated it likely will be punctuated with periods of rate declines due to uh, you know, short-term or intermediate-term economic situations or monetary policy uh, changes. Uh, but again, I think when this is, if you look down the road, if you look back uh, from 2030 or 2035, you're going to see the chart for interest rates move from the lower left to the upper right with, uh, you know, like I said, periods of rates declining, uh, as I stated earlier. So, you know, the economy, as it moves into recession, uh, the anticipation will be um, that rates will go down uh, as bond traders anticipate, as pe speculators and as investors anticipate that the Fed will and the government will run the same playbook they always do, which is to, once we're into, and it's acknowledged that we're in a recession, cut rates, and do QE. Um, people say, well, they won't be able to do that. They won't do it. Uh, so what will they do? Allow a deflationary depression? So if you're a policymaker or if you're at the Fed and your choices are you see banks failing, you see distress in the economy, you see the commercial real estate uh, loans going belly up, you see high yield debt collapsing, you just say, okay, we're just going to follow, um, you know, let the free hand of the market cleanse out all this malinvested. Where in history has that happened? No, they will go back to doing what they do always. Okay. I don't know to the extent they'll do it. It's unknown, but that's the framework you have to work for. They are creatures of habit and they will do that. Now, will that create a lower dollar? Likely. Will that create additional inflation? Likely. Do I know the extent of it? No. And they're just going to have to, like like I said, play whack-a-mole. And that's why 
I go back to this kind of ties back to what I've said for a long time is you can't just put 288 into your 401k anymore and be a passive investor. You have to kind of understand what's going on and be more active. And I think you have to do that as self as wealth self-preservation. Okay, the old uh, playbook doesn't work. And if you try to run it, I think you're going to be disappointed. And so as we, as economic uh, recession begins to become more apparent and the data uh, begins to uh, crystallize around that idea, then I think that we could see a period of lower rates and reliquification. You know, people say, well, no one's going to buy the bond. The Fed will buy the bonds. I mean, come on, guys. It's going to be yield curve control. It's going to be the Federal Reserve doing QE. Whatever they need to call it, that, that's what they'll do. Okay? So I'm not worried about that. Well, that, you know, if you, if you look at the historical narrative, not just of the entire monetary history of the world, when the choice comes, when empires come to a decision point of sacrificing their currency or you know, allowing the government to go bankrupt, they sacrifice the currency every time, okay? And so this will be tremendously uh, profitable for those who understand, you know, but somebody's saying, well, you know, does that mean, does that not mean they make a mistake? And, you know, I heard Mark Faber say on a interview the other day that he expects interest rates to go as high as they did in the 1970s. I mean, He's a PhD. He has a lot more market experience than me. Is that possible? It's entirely possible. Is it impossible? Is it possible that the Fed and the government makes mistakes? Yes, they always make mistakes. So you have to run a base case of what you think will happen. And then you have to pivot as the information comes in differently. You have to be able to be nimble and change your views. That's why you really have to work on removing your biases. And I'm going to get into that in another slide later on uh, about uh, biases that are current on a uh, investment theme that I'm currently bullish on. So again, you have to pay attention to what's going on. You have to understand or try to understand the best you can. It's not easy. And then you have to be willing if the information change or you're proven wrong, you have to pivot. I'll give you a perfect example. In the portfolio, we I speculated, I was speculating on the possibility of a massive regime change uh, in Argentina in the current election cycle they're in. Uh, I had a view that because of the deterioration in the economy, the record amount of inflation, the poverty, the despair, there was a candidate there Javier Malay, who was a very hardcore libertarian, he was going to, he is, he had really tough policies that he wanted to put into place. And so they had the first round of elect, and my view was, okay, if he's able to get into power, or the center-right candidate, Patricia Bullrich, was able to get into power, that at least we could have a CA change in the Peronist socialist status policies, even at the margin could yield a possible increase in value in Argentinian stocks. Because this has happened before in a previous election when a center-right candidate got into power. And uh, even though the person wasn't able to make lasting changes, just the you know idea around it was allowed for a massive revaluation in Argentinian stocks. So going into the polls in the first round of the election in October, um, this particular candidate, Javier Malay, the libertarian candidate, was slightly leading the other two candidates. When the actual re election results came in, he finished second behind the Peronist statist uh, candidate. And so they are now going to have a runoff, I think, November 19th. And right now, the latest polls show the Peronist statist candidate winning. And so the thesis is busted. Um. And so you have to change your view, right? The information changed. The thesis is busted. You don't. Now, what I had done in the past is, well, I'll just hold on and hope that he wins. No, not only did he need to win, he needed 
his party to come power sufficient in the legislature to allow him. And he had to win by a, a large margin in order to have a mandate to overcome the decades of institutional statism. And that simply isn't going to happen, it looks like. And so the thesis is busted. And so you sell and move on to the next idea. You take the loss and move on. We're never, never going to be right 100% on any of our ideas. Even the best investors in the world you know, are somewhere between, you know, 40 to 60% correct in their, in their prognostications. So you're not going to be right every time. And so you have to be quick once, like I said, this is why I write things down. What was my idea for a revaluation or a, you know, for the market to say, you know, push Argentinian stocks up, uh, uh, have a radical libertarian come into power with a mandate for change, like dollarizing the economy, like dismantling the state agencies to get rid of a lot of the bureaucracy. Well, the people there simply don't want that. There's a lot of people are scared. A lot of people are on the dole. And when you start talking that radical, now there is a good 35% of the people there that, you know, want change. You know, when people really start bearing down saying, well, what am I, what's going to happen to my subsidies for my food or for my energy? This guy's talking about doing it. I'm scared what will happen. If you're an old person or if you're a person steeped in decades of this and acclimated to it, you know, you, it's, it's hard to change. So that's kind of going off into a tangent. The bottom line is you have to change your view when the information changes. And when we're doing these speculations and investments, if the reason why we bought something expecting a certain outcome changes, then we have to take the L and move on. And so I kind of tied all this together. It's going to be the same thing with this interest rate stuff. It's very possible. We, you know, the future is unknown. Again, we're working with probabilities. We take in information. We try to look at it as clearly as possible. And we come up with a set of probabilities assigned to it of, of an outcome happening based on that data. If the data changes, then we have to reassess. So that's what's going to happen over the next decade or going further because we're entering uncharted territory. We're entering end of empire type, you know, the old, you know, industrial powerhouse, American free enterprise, what you learned in your 1950s and early 60s civics classes, that doesn't exist anymore. We have a multicultural empire in decline with warring factions trying to grab it as much as they can off the carcass. The, the carcass, the animal, the milk cow has died. The, that's now rotting carcass by the side of the road with as many uh, parasites and scavengers grabbing as much as they can. And so uh, that's what an end stage empire looks like. That's what the United States is. And, uh, you know, you have to be very nimble to maneuver in that type of environment. Is that hyperbole? Maybe, but that's how I'm looking at it. So this is an interesting comment made by uh, Tavi Costa. I think I'm going to try to reach out to him and get him on for an interview. I haven't done any interviews in a long time. You know, there's this new cottage industry of people. I was one of the first people doing a lot of these interviews financial interviews. And then, I mean, there's so many people doing them now. I mean, and I don't begrudge them. I mean, I'll be with them, but, uh, uh, you know, that's like, what can I actually add? I mean, how many times does, do I, does Rick rule need to be interviewed? How many times does the same guys need to interview each other? It gets a little tedious. So, uh, if I do see certain things that I, with people that I am intrigued by or respect, um, I kind of want to kind of get him off the beaten path. So I, I have, I'll try to get him on because I think he, uh, he's a very interesting person and I'm very intrigued by, uh, Brazil as being undervalued and he has particular insight into that being Brazilian and, uh, uh advocated and showing how undervalued it is. But re regardless of that, getting back to this chart, uh, this is a chart that, uh, he put up, it says, uh, this is the largest number of workers on strike in the history of the data. Now, this data set only goes back, it looks like, to 2000, which is 23 years. It said corporate profit margins remain comfortably above their typical averages, leaving room to absorb elevated labor costs as profits dwindle. Needless to say that this development also contributes significantly to inflation. And so we are seeing that, right? We saw labor disputes, UAW, 
We saw the rail workers, I think, last year. Um, we've seen a lot of negotiations with airline pilots, UPS. We've seen massive wage and benefit increases as labor starts flexing its muscle again, like it did in the 70s. You saw a lot of labor uh, unrest uh, because of the inflationary policies that were pursued of the, in the late 60s that bled over into the 70s. And so people were saying, OK, look, I'm falling behind. I'm going to organize uh, as a collective bargaining unit and demand higher wages to compensate me for this inflation. And so we're seeing that, right? So we have people, uh, and when you don't get, if you go into a bargaining with a, an employer as a collective bargaining unit, i.e. a union, and you don't can't reach terms, then the way to help motivate the management or pressure them into uh, agreeing to your proposals is to go on strike and basically shut the company down. And so, you know, you see the amount of labor actions wasn't that high over the last 20 years, and it's spiking now. And so uh, that will, of course, bleed into the normal economy. So you, I'm not saying we're going to enter a wage and price spiral, but it, it does feed into inflation as people demand higher wages, more money comes into the economy, prices go up, people ask for more higher wages, and it, it continues. And we're already in a situation where you know, notwithstanding the fact that we're going to enter this uh, cyclical recession, but secular issues around having enough workforce uh, going forward. That's not just in the U.S. That's that's in the entire OECD because the people are not producing children. And so we're importing the developing world. I'll be generous and call it the developing world. And that's not really working out because the people that you're importing don't have the skill sets or abilities to do the work. We're not importing astrophysicists and, you know, mathematician professors. It's, you know, unskilled labor, uneducated, unskilled labor. And so that creates other issues, which I'm not going to get into. Suffice to say, uh, this chart, this is something to look at. Again, this is, again, not singularly by itself going to create inflation, but it's death by a thousand cuts. The deglobalization, okay, raises prices. This contributes to higher prices, okay? The lack of investment in commodities that you need creates higher prices. I mean, you add this all up, and then you have a secular higher running inflation rate is the point I'm making. So uh, these guys, I can't even pronounce this right, incrementum, whatever, this is a... Ronnie Stoffel's uh, deal, but he puts out these, they put out these, not just him, but his group, these, you know, he does the, uh, uh, in gold, we trust yearly uh, presentation, but then they have the monthly. And I thought this was great. I just put on the title of this chart, long or short this chart. And it shows the gold price going back to 1970 when they came off the gold standard, basically in 1971, I think. And you've seen, you know, the initial spike in 81, uh, 830, five dollars and then you see you know since the uh 2000 you know this these moves higher and you see basically this you know what's going to happen here would i want to be if i had to make a binary bet to be long or short this chart where would i what would i say that's the question it's kind of a rhetorical question but it's also a question to the viewer i think you have to be long this chart right this is not this is, looks like a chart that wants to break out and go higher. This is three times assaulting the 2,000-ish uh, barrier for, for gold, the gold price. You know, we're seeing all-time high gold prices in many, many um, other currencies around the world. And I think it's just a matter of time before this breaks higher, okay? Before there's enough momentum for this to break higher. And I think that happens during the next liquidity cycle that the Fed is on the cusp of doing. When I say the cusp, that doesn't mean next week or next month. You know, with this time next year, we're going to be in a full-blown, obvious recession and uh, probably in the, you know, we will have seen the beginning of the interest rate cuts in QE. I mean, who knows, right? It depends on it, what blows up or what goes wrong in the economy. And I think that next liquidity cycle, which is already beginning worldwide, by the way, which I've pointed out multiple times, 
The majority of central banks around the world since the summer have been cutting rates, not raising them. It's just inevitable before the EU, US, you know, Bank of Canada, Bank of Australia, the, the, the developed world, if you will, if you want to call it that, the OECD countries begin going into their next uh, cycle of cutting rates and doing liquidity. And I think that's just going to be the catalyst for the gold price to go higher. So my answer to this would be, if I, if I had to pick a time frame and say, would you rather be long or short this over the next three years or five years, I'd say that I would rather be long this chart. And so this is another chart from that chart package. Um, this is the blue line is the total amount Aggregated central bank balance sheets, Fed, European Central Bank, Bank of Japan, Bank of China, right here, the numbers over here in trillions of dollars. And you can see it peaked in 2022. You see what happened because of the uh, basically huge increase in central bank balance sheets due to the pandemic lockdowns and what they did to try to, uh, you know, well, I'm not going to get into all that. This is what they did. They printed a lot of money and bought a lot of their own bonds. And then they've been trying to reverse that now. Uh, but you see this brown or light brown chart with gold chart, whatever you want to call it. This is not about gold. This is the year, year on year change in the central bank balance sheets. And you see that it uh, peaked, the year on year change peaked uh, before the total amount did basically in 2021 and crashed, right? Because otherwise it would have had hyperinflation if all these central banks just kept blowing up their balance sheets. And so the year over year changed and peaked and then inevitably the total um, dollar value uh, of central bank balance sheets is rolled over and is working its way lower. What you will note here is that this down here is now it's reversing the year over year change in, in the central bank balance sheets is beginning to reverse. And again, that goes back to what I said before around already emerging markets, uh, countries outside the OECD, which have already now entered their rate cutting cycle. The majority of the central banks that matter, like for, for example, in Latin America, Brazil, Colombia, Peru, Chile, they've already begun cutting rates. They were the first to raise rates during this last inflationary cycle. They're now cutting rates. And you're seeing more and more countries around the world. And inevitably, these uh, countries will uh, have to expand their balance sheets because the debts are so large and they will not have an option. And so you're starting to see that turn now uh, in the year over year change. So uh, that's how I'm looking at it. Um, I'm not saying that I'm correct, but uh, again, that's what's going to push, I think, this to new highs. This is what's going to accelerate the gold price. And once we break higher, there's going to be a lot of momentum, I think, that comes in once it becomes obvious. Okay. And then we're going to have another bull run. I mean, you know, you had a bull run here and you had a bull run here. Uh, could this double over the next, you know, five years? Yes, easily. So we have to continue to watch this. The good thing is, is that every month they update these charts and we can keep an eye on it. I have my own proprietary methodology for tracking the world central bank actions. Again, banks have swung from a net tightening to, to beginning to loosen, you know, not in dollar, not in necessarily dollar value, but in number of banks. So you see the momentum shifting is, is my point. That's why I'm saying. That's why I encourage people to get their buy list together because after this, uh, after this tax loss selling season, um, I intend to be moving into a lot of the uh, of the gold stocks that I like in in a higher uh, in a more aggressive manner. So I wanted to talk about this. I've been talking about this as a mar mile marker for a media thing, for a news item. Um, it doesn't really matter, you know, before if it was 980 billion, the interest on the debt, but this 1 trillion number, you know, draws a lot of attention. And so we, we broke it finally. It says U.S. debt interest payments surge past 1 trillion yearly pace, worsening concerns about massive borrowing. 
so we've talked about it, uh, you know, ad nauseum. And you say, okay, well, my life's not really affected. I don't really see problem. It's kind of like, you know, CO2. They say the CO2 levels are up, but nothing's really affecting me personally. So this I thought was a good visual to help bring it into a little bit more focus. This is from Jesse Felder. A tweet says, estimated annualized interest payments on the U.S. government debt pile climbed past $1 trillion at the end of last month. That amount has doubled in the past 19 months and is equivalent to basically 16% of the entire federal budget for the fiscal year 2020. Two. So <laughs> we've seen exponential charts before. If this was a uranium stock or gold stock or some other stock that you owned, you would be extremely exuberant about this rocket ship ride. <laughs> We've seen this before in other stocks. We've seen this in tech stocks. We've seen this in Nifty 50. I'm, I'm, you know, this is not good when it's interest on federal debt of a declining empire. This is not something to be exuberant about. You know, you're currently at, at this $1 trillion level, 16% of the entire federal budget is being consumed by interest payments. And let me point out something else. We're not even in a recession yet. Okay? And we're already running institutionally fixed deficits of over a trillion dollars a year. I've pointed this out before. So the debt piles can growing every year and supposedly an expanding economy. So what happens when we do go into the next re recession, which is going to be a hard landing, get ready for it, it's coming, and tax revenues dry up as unemployment goes up, capital gains, taxes decline because the stock market's going to decline, a lot of markets are going to decline, and the revenue declines, but the bills are still there. As a matter of fact, spending increases during a recession because there are automatic stabilizers built in due to legislation for, you know, higher payments for unemployment insurance payments and health care and subsidies, all, you know, more food stamps, SNAP, all this stuff. The usage of that increases during the recession while revenue decreases. You see where this is going? It's not sustainable. Is it actionable over the next month or two? Probably not. But it's something that you need to be aware of because the only way out is cut spending, as I said before. You know, you cut spending, you get your fiscal house in order, and there's a lot of pain. I just told you that they've endured pain like this, inflation, currency deprivation, economic decline, poverty, despair in Argentina for decades. They had the opportunity, they have the opportunity to change that or go in a different direction and they're too scared to do it. That will happen here too. And so the only way out will be, well, we're not going to come to you and tell you the truth and try to do the right thing because you don't want that. And I want to get my cushy political job. So we'll just print more money. I mean, that's where this is going, guys. It's coming to a head. And so, you know, it's, like I said, reading a headline like this, you're like, okay, we went past a trillion. Um, everything's still working. I don't see how this is affecting me. I think when you see this, you see, again, this something ain't right here. <laughs> so, again, if I this was a stock, I would be looking to, like, trim my position because inevitably this is going to uh, roll over and crash. In the case of the United States government, the interest on the, you know, they're going to have to cut rates. They're going to have to buy back bonds. They're going to, you know, they're going to have to do yield curve control. They're going to have to inflate that debt away. They're going to have to steal your wealth, steal your life away from you, your work. You know, when you work for a currency unit, it needs to maintain its value because your sweat, your labor, the days of your life are being expended for you to get those dollars that this government criminal entity is debasing so they're stealing they're literally stealing 
your life away from you. They're stealing your life force. You know, uh, that's how I look at it. It's criminal. It's not the first time in history that it's happened. It will continue to happen. It's just how it is. But you can do something about it. You can protect yourself. You can actually profit from it. So, but you have to understand it. So this happened on Friday also. <laughs> Moody's Investor Service, I put here, oops, oops, major problem. Moody's Investor Services on Friday lowered its ratings outlook on the United States government to negative from stable, pointing to rising risks to the nation's physical strength. However, keep in mind, because you know this, they have to throw these blurbs in there, the ratings agency has affirmed the long-term issuer and senior unsecured ratings of the U.S. Well, you know, I don't agree with that. That I expect them to say that. But the important thing to say is, is that the ratings outlook, that means they haven't downgraded, but they've moved it to negative. That means it's the downgrade is coming. Okay. And yes, the United States is the clean is the less smelly shirt in the laundry in the laundry hamper. That doesn't mean I want to wear a dirty shirt. So going on from the article, which I'll post a link to it, I'll try to post links as before in the show notes. You can scroll down under the video and click on the articles and read them for yourself to make sure that uh, I'm not taking them out of context. Uh, it says here from the article, in the context of higher interest rates without effective physical policy measures to reduce government spending or increase revenues, that means higher taxes, the agency said, Moody's expects that U.S. fiscal deficits will remain very large, significantly weakening debt affordability. There you have it, folks. Continuing on. As far as keeping the nation's ratings at AAA, Moody said that it expects the U.S. to, quote, retain its ex exceptional economic strength, unquote. Further positive growth surprises over the medium term could at least slow the deterioration in debt affordability. See, this is what you hear from people like uh, Newt Gingrich and other people back in the day when they were trying to deal with these problems. Well, if we can get the economy to grow fast enough, we can grow our way out of it. You're not going to grow your way out of it because you're not even looking at the entitlements that are 100 or $200 trillion, depending who you talk to, that no one's paid for. You're an end stage empire. Go back and look at other empires that failed. They failed for the same reasons. They spent too much money and they tried to overexpand militarily and it just consumes you. And they're not going to reverse it. There's no reverse gear. There's no exit ramp. You know, I have to go to something's going on in DC. I don't know. I mean, when I go there, I have to go there occasionally. And it's booming. There's construction cranes all over, like Arlington, Alexandria. I can't get my bearings right. I have to go there. The hotel rates, I have to go to the office, which is by DuPont Circle. There's hotels there. I booked a hotel two, two weeks ago. It's $500 a night. A colleague just tried to book. It's $1,000 a night. That place is booming. Everything's fine in D.C. in the Imperial you know, Center. Everything's champagne and... And, and, and caviar there's no there's no recession there it's not going to be one so you see this this is going to happen i mean you know in the context you know basically says here uh in the context of higher interest rates without effective fiscal policy measures to reduce government spending or increase revenues do you see that happening do you see reduced government spending or massive tax increases, I think around the margin over time, you'll see higher taxes, but they just can't come out and say, well, you actually have to pay for this government, so you have to raise everybody's taxes 50%. There'll be a massive throw, throw the bums out movement. I mean, the problem is not the government. The problem is the people in this country. They're, the people that are in your government are a reflection of you, of us, collectively. We send these people here and we don't, think this is a bad thing most people run their life like this most people don't have five hundred dollars in a checking account to put new tires on their car they just you know i've listened to story after story 
Uh, I follow these guys on YouTube that sell cars or sell used cars. All the shenanigans people were doing. Buy a car, brand new car. People were, you know, this guy was showing different cars he bought at auction that were like destroyed by people. They go in, they went in, bought a car. Banks gave them the loans. The car dealerships gave them, gave them the cars. They drove it off the lot, immediately canceled the insurance, never registered the car, ran it into the ground until they finally crashed it or it got, the, the, the bank was eventually able to track them down and repossess the thing and the whole thing's trashed. But that's how people, that's how, that's not everybody, of course, but a lot of people, that's how they run their life. So what, what, what do you expect? What have you done, Mr. Franklin? What have you people done in that convention hall? We have given you a republic, ma'am, if you can keep it. So this all kind of goes into one thing where to protecting yourself or understanding what's happening, if you agree with the thesis put forward over the long term, I'm saying three to five, 10 years down the road, inflation is your future higher unemployment, economic uh, decline, more, more money printing, all the things that, you know, like you see in Argentina or these other uh, places that are ran into the ground. That's your future here. And so what do you got to do to protect yourself? Well, real assets, real assets. They're extremely undervalued compared to financial assets, you know, I like using the Buffett indicator, which is the market cap of the stock market divided by the GDP. It's not, it's been called his favorite indicator, but it's a good indicator. It's still, financial assets are still too high relative to real assets. And so I think, you know, you have to be selective. You have to pick your spots. It's not a one-way ride from the lower left on the chart to the upper right. But if you, I think that's where we end up. We've pointed this out many times over the last couple of years. And so far, uh, at least in the actionable intelligence alert portfolio, it's been working out. You know, we're, we're staying ahead of the S&P. We're staying ahead of inflation. It's not easy. Not all the ideas have worked. But you know, collectively as a model portfolio, it's doing well. And I think this is really what you have to do. Again, I go back to one of my overriding mantras, sell overvaluation and buy undervaluation. What's undervalued? Real assets. They're going to benefit from the anticipated debasement of the US dollar, which is going to happen because of the debts. And it doesn't matter who we elect. We're past that now. Um, again, I've said it before and I'll say it again. Uh, the things that can be done, the things that are politically possible will not be sufficient. And the things, the things that you need to do to fix it are not politically possible. And the things that are politically possible are not sufficient to fix the problem. It's just how it is. You know, I was... Somebody wrote in on one of the comments, this guy just keeps repeating himself over and over. When is he going to give me some actionable ideas or real ideas? He just gets on here and repeats himself every week because this is what it is. This is your future. If you want the juice, if you want the gravy, if you want the good stuff, you got to pay. I don't just give stuff away. This is a business model I'm running here. I get on here and put the videos out and put the weekly news up in, in context of a thesis that I generalize, and if you want to know what I'm doing, you got to subscribe. So that's the answer to that particular gentleman's question. You know, somebody, I used to, when I first started doing this, I would give stuff away free. People don't value things that are given away for free. And why should I do it? I mean, uh, anything worth doing is worth doing for a profit. And I have expenses. And, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, going into retirement, and I've this newsletter's done fairly well. If I went in full retirement, did it full time, you know, I'm not going to do work for free. That's ridiculous. Who would do that? No, that's not the majority attitude, but that's the answer to people that think that. Yes, I'm going to continue to repeat this 
and I'll change my views as soon as the facts change. I don't see any they're talking about having another government shutdown, guys, as the debts just continue to pile up. You know, we're just going back to the old playbook as, you know, we ha we're at risk as, of, of having another war. You know, we're embroiled now in a disaster in Eastern Europe, another emerging disaster in the Middle East, and talk about certain factions in the U.S. wanting to expand that now. And still on the back burner... According to the Pentagon, and the administration is 2025. We're gonna we're gonna deal with China. Do you, do, do you think that that's a good idea in the context of everything else that's going on? Hard assets, folks. We've talked about it. They're undervalued. So I wanted to talk about this. This is why I want to get another reason I want to get Tavi Costa on. This is his chart, actually. Brazilian stocks, you know, they've been in a bear market for a long time. Uh, it's a country that has a lot of issues itself, but it is a economy that has a very large agricultural output, mineral output, oil and gas output. It's a country of real assets. And as we have shifted now from a financial, as financial assets are extremely overvalued, one could say all-time bubble type valuations, which is what I say, everything bubble. And if we see a move out of that, a deflating of that bubble and a move to undervalued assets, i.e. real assets, which is pushed even harder and further because of the monetary debasement that's going to occur, then Brazil is possibly situated to take advantage of that. Now, the retort that I see when this chart goes up on Twitter is, well, President Lula is a communist. I wouldn't do that. Do you see this run over here on the left? This is why most people don't make money. From 2002 to 2010, President Lulu, that was his first time he was in office. And Brazilian stocks did this during his so-called communist regime. Do I agree with President Lula's views on things? No. But I think people overestimate how much impact that a particular one leader has in some of these things. Again, this is the time that he was in power before. And this is what happened in, to Brazilian stocks. I will say this. This is the same idea that a lot of dummies had here in the U.S. or the bleacher bums, the cheap seats, what have you. People that are first level thinkers. You know, when President Obama was elected, I'm totally opposed to him 100 percent. You know, but when he came into power, when he was elected, was after the great financial crisis, right? Or during it. I don't know. I haven't synced it all up in my mind. It's a while ago. But the Federal Reserve created a bunch of liquidity. I remember the S&P bottomed, you know, during that during that time. I think it's 666, which I think is interesting. But, you know, what did it do subsequent to that? Well, if you didn't want to invest in U.S. stocks because you were opposed to President Obama and his policies, which I was, you missed out because stocks aren't driven by President Obama's views on things. They're driven in the short and medium term by liquidity and sediment. And liquidity was put into the economy, massive amount, which led to a sediment change, which led to the stock market going up massively. And so you really have to understand and control your biases or, you know, you're just going to leave a lot of money on the table. And I'm guilty of that as anyone else. I'm not a perfect being. I have a lot of biases, but I try to recognize them and push back against them. And if you get to the clear thinking, then you can say, I'm in this to make money, not be right. And there's a difference. So I think this has an opportunity to go higher. Um, we'll see what happens. But uh, in the portfolio, we have some... I've talked about Brazilian stocks before. The thesis is they're in uh, 
begun have cut begun cutting rates. We've already seen some activity in some of the stocks, mostly financial stocks I'm in right now. May expand that over time, uh, but I think there's an opportunity here. You you know if you want you know if you want to take advantage of just. I'll just throw one out there. I think it's a little bit overvalued. I don't have it in the portfolio, but a guy could just say, okay, I don't know that much about all these countries you're talking about, Latin America, blah, 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 blah. Just buy Mercado Libre. It's like the Amazon of Latin America. You probably do fine. Not a recommendation, not financial advice, something to look at gives you blanket coverage of the entire place, including Mexico, South America, the whole shebang. They're growing like a weed, but the valuation is very high. So get into my soapbox now about certain things. I won't go too hard politically, but I just want to point out uh, how we've been continuing to be correct on this. And again, following the methodology of betting against the thesis that is incorrect. Title of the slide, electrify everything means higher energy costs. This will also contribute to the inflation we're going to experience, higher secular inflation over the next decade or so. From the article, some of America's richest NGOs are pushing policies that ban the direct use of natural gas in homes and businesses. We've seen this in New York State, for example. While they claim the ban on gas is needed to address climate change, a hoax, these bans will result in dramatic increases in energy costs and impose a regressive tax on the poor and middle class. Yes. More proof of that came last month when the Energy Information Administration released its winter fuels outlook for 2023 and 2024. The EIA, as you well know, folks listening, is a federal government agency. And you, there's a link, if you go to the link that I put for this article, you can link to the report and read it yourself of the Winter Fuels Outlook. But basically what I want to tell you is this, the report shows that the average US homeowner who uses electricity to heat their home will pay about $462 more this winter than ones who use natural gas. That means heating with electricity costs about 77% more than heating with natural gas. There you have it. We've said that before. They want to electrify the entire economy. That means higher costs. Why burn the gas in a natural, in a combined cycle power plant where there's losses, you have heat losses, you have friction losses in the turbine for the cogen and the steam turbine. You have all kinds of losses that can be calculated. And that's why the efficiency of the combined cycle plant of the energy you get out of it is less than you put in. Why not just directly pipe the gas and then you run the, through transmission lines and distribution lines to your house where you use an electric coil type heater in your central air system like we have in Texas. That's what we have here from but we don't have months and months of freezing temperatures in most places where I live in South Texas. We have a couple weeks usually. And so it makes sense here, but it's not the efficient way to do it. It doesn't ma make sense to put in all kinds of natural gas distribution networks for two weeks of heating a year. But if you live in Minnesota or Ohio, or Montana or something like that, or in the Great Lakes states where it freezes or in Canada where it's, you know, months and months of freezing temperatures, then it makes sense to just pipe the natural gas to your furnace. You extract more of the energy with less losses, but that contributes to climate change, John. Oh, okay. Well, you still live in a democracy, most of you. You can wake up and still do something about this. But they intend to keep doing these policies until you go in and literally throw them out. Your time frame is shrinking at the ballot box. At some point, it will come where you won't be able to get them out. 
And how do I know they'll just keep doing it? They don't learn. These people have no reverse gear, and they never say sorry. They just keep abusing you and abusing you because they're not going to reverse their policy until you get rid of them, however you decide to get rid of them. 19, can vote them out. 1917 in St. Petersburg, late 1700s in France. Different ways that these governments are gotten rid of. Hopefully it's done peacefully. Why? Here we go. We've been talking about the Siemens wind energy saga. This isn't the only one. And so instead of turning the nuclear reactors back on in Germany, because the Green Party is philosophically and religiously in, to their core against nuclear, that's where they got their start, Atomkraft non danke. Nuclear power, no thank you. They will never reverse that till you get rid of them. Instead, we're going to bail out Siemens Wind Energy. Told you. Siemens Energy, facing significant losses, is in talks for up to a 15 billion euro in guarantees with the German state covering 80% of the initial funding. It's not the German state. What's the German state? That's the German people. You're going to pay for failure. Failed ideas, failed policies, failed corporate execution. But we're going to keep the reactors off. Okay. Siemens AG shares have plummeted over 70% since mid-June, with the company abandoning its 2023 profit outlook due to challenges in its wind turbine unit. This is also part of the article later on. Just to remind you folks, in the UK, the UK government is set to offer higher subsidies for offshore wind projects following a previous auction where developers backed out due to low pricing, indicating growing financial strains in the renewable energy sector. The renewable energy sector don't work at 5%, 5.25 Fed funds rate. It just doesn't in higher commodity prices. Uh, it can work in exceptional locations where there's tremendous amounts of wind or irradiance for solar panels. It doesn't work everywhere. But when you have free money, all types of bad decisions get made. Locations that are marginal get built because the money's free. You know, remember, a project is like a linear equation. The equipment cost, the labor cost, oh, the financing cost. And if it equals a certain number, well, what's, is it worth building? And a major cost is the financing cost. Input costs of labor and materials are going up and the cost of money goes up. At some point, it doesn't make any sense to build the thing because you can't get a return. And so you have to go to the government to force the, the price higher for the electricity produced. Who pays the higher electricity price? You as the consumer who's already struggling, okay? Are you getting this? Are you figuring this? There's a reason why we use natural gas and fossil fuels, because they're cheap. Not because we want to destroy the environment. Can we use them in a way that doesn't, that leads to, eco, to environmental stewardship? Absolutely. We've been doing it a long time. You're not going to run these societies successfully on 100% intermit, intermittent. Not going to argue about it. I've been proven right. Unless you want to pay more and more money for it. That's the only way it's going to happen. Higher and higher costs to bail these people out. Here's another one. Plug Power. You know, I've, I, I liked Plug Power. I followed them. I never owned the stock. I like the idea of hydrogen fuel cells. This company's been around since I got out of the Navy. I've been following it off and on for like over 20 years. I like hydrogen fuel cells. They, they're cool. I like the technology. They're not economic. Oh, that's just the bottom line. Can they make sense in some limited applications off grid? Yeah. When you're in some remote area somewhere and you don't have grid access, and you you know this can work, I guess. But you know the market doesn't want this stuff because it costs too much, and so they live off subsidies and grants with the promise that just give us some more money, a higher budget, and we'll, we'll bring it in. The cost will come down. That's what we're always told. And so here we are. Plug Power issues going concern warning. What's a going concern warning? That's when you announce that you may go out of business, basically. From the article, 
Shares of Plug Power, a company specializing in hydrogen and fuel cell energy, plummeted by 30% in pre-market trading in New York. This steep decline followed the company's third quarter earnings report on Thursday evening, which cited, quote, unprecedented supply challenges in the hydrogen network in North America. Plug Power reported a third quarter loss of $283 million, equivalent to 47 cents a share, widening from a loss of $170 million, or 30 cents per share, in the same quarter one year ago. The company's revenue increased to $199 million from $189 million a year earlier and slightly missed the Bloomberg consensus of $200 million. RBC Capital Markets Analyst estimates Plug Power would need about $750 million to boost liquidity over the next 12 months. Well, I mean, private equity or a bank or somebody should give them the money if they think it's viable, but more than likely they'll go to the government and get a grant or a subsidy and continue on uh, instead of going out of business and having the resources reallocated to more viable and uh, entities. Okay, but that's not going to happen. We're just going to prop this stuff up and the that all leads to higher costs for energy and doesn't solve our fundamental problems around energy security. Again, this is why I'm so bullish long term on the nuclear power industry and uranium, because all roads lead there. If you are somebody that worships the earth and thinks that CO2 has to be reduced, you have to end up at nuclear. If you're somebody that believes that a country should have energy security, nuclear is in that mix. If you're somebody that believes that cheap, ubiquitous, and stable power leads to economic growth is a, is a input into other parts of the economy, then it leads to uh, nuclear power. So that's why I'm bullish. People that are rational around the world, i.e. the global south and east, realize that. That's why nuclear power is exploding there. It will return to the west, likely through the initiation and build out of various small modular reactors, which are being worked on. So I am optimistic, but you're going to see more and more of this type of nonsense until this finally just goes away. Uh, and like I said, we have reached peak ESG. No one buys, the majority of people don't buy it anymore. I mean, how much longer are people going to put up with these morons going into museums and, you know, throwing paint on paintings and chanting about stopping oil? I mean, we're, we're past that, guys. There's always going to be a fringe element of nitwits and nut jobs, but uh, the majority of people understand that there's, no magic answers. There's only trade-offs. And that's going to lead to opportunity for people like ourselves. Okay, guys, that's it for this week. Again, please, uh, if you're on the podcast, I'm trying to grow the podcast. Some people have uh, been helping me out. You know, if you like the podcast on the podcast forums, you're on Spotify. I don't know how it all works on those things. Leave a comment, hit the like, whatever, however it works on those things, trying to increase the reach of the podcast. Uh, you know, when I used to have it before, it was pretty, pretty big. There was several hundred people and I had to move the platform. It's kind of really slowed down. So if you, if you, if you enjoy the podcast, if you listen to it going to work, if I've made it more convenient for folks, you know, I'm having to pay money now to do that. I'm not charging anybody and I won't, but I really need to kind of grow it a little bit more to make it, you know, make it more viable. I'm putting effort into it and it's like the 80, 20 rule. You know, it's, I'd rather put 80% of my effort into the 20% of the highest return. So I uh, need some help on that. If you're a podcast listener uh, and, and we want to keep it going, we have to, uh, kind of have to try to help it out a little bit. Okay, guys, uh, that's it for this week. We'll talk to you next week. Thank you.